This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Late Boomers, our podcast guide to creating your third act with style, power, and impact. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. And I'm Mary Elkins. Join us as we bring you conversations with successful entrepreneurs, entertainers, and people with vision who are making a difference in the world. Everyone has a story, and we'll take you along for the ride on each interview, recounting the journey our guests have taken to get where they are, inspiring you to create your own path to success. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Kathy Worthington. Welcome to an inspiring episode of Late Boomers with our guest, Dr. Tristina Anderson, who will reveal secrets for turning life's biggest challenges into launch pads for success. And I'm Mary Elkins. Get ready to hear the author and former C-suite executive's practical strategies for boomers to think braver, embrace change, and discover new untapped powers within themselves. Welcome, Tristina. Thank you, ladies, Kathy, Mary, and your audience. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to have you. Thank you. Tristina, please tell our Boomer audience about your journey and how you overcame the challenges that you faced and transformed them into opportunities. Oh, well, I have to go back a couple decades. Uh (laughs) Yeah, yeah, so (laughs) Um, I think the biggest milestone that uh, I had to kind of transform is uh, on August 2nd, 1996, I was 25 years old and almost six months pregnant. And I was told by my family physician that I was HIV positive. Oh, Oh, my. Yes. Oh, my. Yes. So um, it was quite a shock. That was 28 years ago. And back then, an HIV diagnosis um, was a death sentence. So my yeah. doctor had told me um, I probably only had a couple years to live. And same with my unborn child. Oh. Um, it was quite a shocking uh, situation. Um, my goodness. Yeah. And that's kind of probably where my initial journey started, uh, going through that, um, having to work on forgiveness. Um, I received HIV from my husband and he had known about the diagnosis and didn't disclose it. Oh. And that's really kind of how I wrote my, um, memoir, um, resilience, picking up my shattered pieces. Uh, I ended up um, being married to this gentleman for 25 years. I actually had two children <laughs> through the whole, the whole process. Uh, both of my children are HIV negative, but what that, uh, did for me is put me in a mindset of regardless of your situation, circumstances, and your conditions, you can build a life you absolutely love. And that's mm-hmm. kind of how I did my whole design. In fact, when, um, when I was younger and and growing up, I lived a very privileged life, not spoiled, but privileged. Uh, I grew up in a home that had an indoor swimming pool, skiing and stuff like that. And my parents ended up getting divorced when I was 13 years old. Uh-huh. And I, yeah, right in grade nine and, um, you know, transported from the high school where I knew all my friends to a town where I didn't know anybody. Oh, and so hard. What got left behind, though, was an alcoholic father. So went and um, had had an alcoholic father. My mom started a new life. And and that actually put in the mindset of me when I was growing up that I was never going to be financially dependent on anybody. So we went from this home where, like I said, had an indoor swimming pool, had horses, had all these things to living into a low rentals where my mom's vehicle ended up getting repossessed. Wow. Big oh, change. Yeah. So yeah. that kind of put the mindset into me is that I needed to be independent for myself. I needed to do these things. Of course, fast forwarding to when I end up getting married and being in my early mid twenties, 25 years old and being diagnosed with HIV, having to go off work um, earlier, 
not being able to do the things I want to do, like breastfeed and be on mat, proper mat leave, um, I ended up having to apply for social assistance because my husband wasn't, um, we didn't have, <laughs> after the diagnosis, we didn't really have that great of a relationship as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we end up yeah. you know, kind of living fairly separate lives. Um, and then again, like a lot of happiness ended up happening. Like I said, I had two kids, both HIV negative. And I was, as I was building that financial independent in the back of my mind, I was thinking I have to build wealth for my kids. Cause I don't know how many, how many days, how many years I have left to continue to work. So I ended up getting a master's degree, a doctorate degree, working in the C-suite, but I ended up spending a disproportionate amount of time at business. And I had these two beautiful children I couldn't spend any time with. Mm -hmm. So I was felt, feeling that tug of war. And we, we talk about, especially as women, mothers, daughters, spouses, all that thing. We always talk about work-life balance. Mm -hmm, and, right. and that, that, that terminology never really clicked with me because the definition of balance is equal distribution mm -hmm. and you can't have equal distribution. The other thing I thought that was kind of really weird when people would say, Oh, do you have work-life balance? I'm like, well, then you're assuming that work is one pillar and everything else is another, but in actuality, we're just one person. And we well, wear yeah. multiple different hats. And it sounds like along the right. way you you must have gotten healthy. Yeah, I'm I'm very you very obviously healthy. didn't succumb to the AIDS in the yeah. first year, like he said. Yeah. So I ended up being on medication right from the get go. I was very, very lucky um that I ended up getting diagnosed and, and my husband got diagnosed at the same time. He was starting a business and he needed to get a, a swab for health insurance in Canada mm -hmm. for insurance. And I thought, well, you know, we're, I'm in my early mid twenties and that's the responsible thing to do is to get life insurance. Cause I'm pregnant and we were having a child and had that not happened, I would never have known. And the outcome would have been a lot different. Mm -hmm. So I believe that things happen for uh, a certain, for a reason. Right. And I kept mm -hmm. that HIV diagnosis, um, to myself um, up until when I wrote the memoir about three, four months ago. So I never disclosed oh. that to anybody because I thought being in the business world, mm -hmm. being in the boardroom, being all of these different things, I, I thought people would feel that I did something wrong, that I would have shame, that I, they may not want to continue to work with me, which is, which is wrong. And, you should and they might, that. and they might be afraid of being close to you all these different things yeah, right? and it's easy to feel that and we yeah. we all we all would think that people are going to judge us like that yeah and, and they might have but it's interesting now that you're on podcasts talking about it you know <laughs> well, and that was that was um so again fast forwarding many years i end up divorcing um that gentleman that i was married to and i and i found love again and back in 2018 um, and Good. I, but I carried that with myself to say, who, who would love me, which is again, oh, yeah. a horrible thing to say, to think about yourself. Right. But I was think, you know, I'm in my forties. Um, you know, I had two kids, my kids were growing up. My son was back in, in Canada. Um, and my daughter was you know just 16 years old, but I thought who would, who would want to be with, with me? But I actually went to, a. uh, a psychiatrist and a psychologist and talked about these things. And they said, you know, HIV now is more like a chronic illness. You take medication every day. I'm a very healthy person. I take my health very seriously. So my mm -hmm. doctor at the time said to me, she goes, you can find love again. I'm like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to want to do this, but I end up uh, meeting this wonderful man. And then it took Online. us a couple did you nope. meet online in person in person, <laughs> in person. Um, the way to do it <laughs> but it took me about six months um to gain the courage to disclose my health condition mm -hmm. so we dated and dated and i thought um i it took a long time and it was actually i i'm sure you ladies know the author Brene brown 
Yes. Mm. All to courage and all that stuff. And, and I mean, I just love her. <laughs> so she's brilliant. She's wonderful. And she talked about vulnerability, um, courage, uh, things like that. And I thought, um, I deserve love and I deserve to be happy. I am a good person. And I end up getting the courage and, and, dis- and disclose my health condition. Of course, we got married and, and all that kind of wonderful thing. So but he obviously. That's great. He said, yeah, it didn't matter. That's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, Christina, talk about resilience and t- talk about why it's so important. And also tell us more about your book, Resilience, Picking Up My Shattered Pieces. Yeah. I think, I think as individuals, um, we have to be or build a resilience in order to move forward in the world. We all have a sad story. We all have things that have happened to us in our past and without the resilience and moving forward, we we could fall back into the, um, the our circumstances, our conditions, the woe is me, all of those type of situations where in life you you have all that's available to you, right? It's taking those courageous yeah. steps, being resilient yeah. to move forward. I mean, we don't know how much time we have on this earth, right? You know, I think of life as an hourglass. And, Mm -hmm. you know, um, there was lots of times where I, you know, played small, didn't want to do the things that I should have done and have a voice and a platform. But probably the last four or five years, I thought I have a story that should be shared with others and build up that resilient life, regardless of what happens. As far as I know, we're only here once. How long did it take you to write the book? Uh, about six months. That's good. Yeah. Six. I mean, it, it's my memoir. The first version I actually wrote, um, didn't have my HIV diagnosis in it. And, um, I talked to my kids and my husband about it. And both my kids and my husband said, if you're going to tell a story, your story, you should tell your whole story. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, I agree don't with know them. if I have the courage. And they said, you, you got this, you can do it. And I did. Well, give us a little advice on what steps we can take to begin designing our ideal lives. I think that some of the best things that we can do is really take that step back and say to yourself, what would I love to have in my life? Again, regardless of our current st- situations is build your life by design, not default. Most of us get up every single day and we do the same things today as we did yesterday because we get into that, you know, the hamster wheel. And Mm -hmm. I I talked about earlier about um, spending a disproportionate amount of time at work and seeing my kids left behind and my kids were getting themselves up ready for school. Sometimes I get home really late, driving to work, back to work. And one one year we went actually um, on a holiday to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And so we actually end up doing that quite a few times. And we were there one year and my, my son said to me, he was going into grade 10, grade 10. He was just finishing grade nine. He said to me, he said, mom, he said, why couldn't we just live here? Mm. And I said to him, you know what? I might be able to make that happen. So I sold my house in Canada. And again, that's building your life by design. I didn't know how it was all going to work up out, but I trusted that the universe was going to know or whatever your beliefs are, God, all of those things. I knew somebody knew that I perhaps didn't. And I think once you make a decision in life, the universe or whatever opens up and things that you mm-hmm. didn't realize was going to happen was going to happen. So I sold I my house in that. Canada, bought a house sight unseen in Mexico. Mm. I mean, I was familiar with it, but I bought it online sight unseen. Got a really good deal because it was post um, the U.S. market crash. So I bought it from an investor in the U.S. I got a really good deal. Um, made all the arrangements and I moved there with my kids. Now, I had a lot of outside individuals say, it's pretty irresponsible of you, don't you think, to pick up and move your kids to Mexico and this and this thing. You know, I didn't go with my husband. We were still married at the time, but they didn't know about my health diagnosis. And I thought, again, because yeah. I that private. Yeah. I want to give my kids the best life that they could possibly have, including me. I want to spend time with them and do all of these things. So I just took the steps that I could. And, wow. and I think that's where the brave thinking and the resilience comes in is 
don't be afraid of what the future might hold. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted, I was thinking about that when you were talking about courage and I thought most people are so afraid to take that step. So talk about how we can embrace fear like you did and use it as a catalyst for growth. Because I think even looking at people who are older, who've done so much with their lives, taking the next step is, is a fearful moment. Yeah. Talk about it, please. Yeah. And, you know, I think in life, it's, it's, um, I, one, one person that was in my life years ago said, um, um, you know, the graveyard's full of irreplaceable people and never let desire become regret. And so again, another book by Bonnie Rare, I don't know if you guys have read it, but she talks about the Mm -hmm. five mistakes, the five regrets that people have at the end of life. And so One of the things that I do when I work with some of my clients is live your life regret free, right? You know, when you get up and you talk about fear, yeah, fear is sometimes debilitating and you can get up and you feel nervous going on the stage or you feel nervous telling somebody you love them for the first time or you feel those things. But when you actually go and you're at, if we get to the point where we have the ability to lay our head down for the last time. I think we want to close our eyes for that last time and say, I played full out, not I wish I would have said I loved you more or I wish I would have done that. To me, that fear, um, I'd rather be scared and do something than have regret and and live my life saying, I wish I would have done that. I love that. Right. And, and then what about how vulnerability plays into this? What's the power of vulnerability? I think I think you you have to be vulnerable to live a true authentic life. When I think about different things in in my life about true vulnerability, the first one was um being really vulnerable is telling my husband my my husband uh now that I had HIV. I mm-hmm. had to be vulnerable in order to have this individual in my life and I was actually at a crossroads to say you know, am I willing to walk away from this relationship, this wonderful human being, or am I going to be vulnerable and be courageous and take the steps and, 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 and disclose? Because in my mind, I was living in Mexico. My husband lived in Canada. And so in my mind, I played out, well, what's the worst that can happen? If I tell him my health diagnosis and he doesn't want to have anything to do with me, I'm just going back to Mexico. That's where I live anyways, right? So mm-hmm. I was kind of playing mm-hmm. these emotions in my head. And and again, I think that's the the vulnerability. The second major vulnerability moment in my life is, is writing my memoir and disclosing mm-hmm. my HIV status. Yeah. Did you have girlfriends even that came up to you and said, what is this? Why didn't you tell us? Well, and yeah, <laughs> a lot of people, my second, so I did two book launches already. My second book launch was to my family, my aunties, my cousins, who nobody knew. And I, and I wrote passages outside the book. The only person that knew was my mom and my stepdad. And I had my aunties, my cousins, everybody there that I've, that I've been, you know, close, close, close with all my life. And they were just like shocked. One, they said to my mom, I can't believe you carried this for 28 years. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, and and the other thing too is, as I told you, nobody knew. When my ex-husband and I were going through our divorce, I had to disclose um, my health, our, our health conditions to my two kids. They didn't even know. Mm. What did they say? Um... They were, they, they, well, they were six years, they're six years apart. So my son was 22 and my daughter was uh, 16, I think at the time. So my son, um, he was sad that, that I didn't tell him, but he understood why. And I said, I didn't tell you because as a mom, I was protecting you as my child. Mm-hmm. All these years, I would have just honestly, if my ex-husband and I hadn't got divorced, um, he ended up having a few affairs while we were married. So I had some legal requirements I had to do where I had to contact these ladies and I had to let them know that 
um, my ex-husband was HIV positive as we were going through this divorce. So wow. my kids were going to be impacted. So yeah. I had that, to let them know before this was going to happen. That is such a heavy thing to have to go through. Was, and no it, wonder you didn't want your son to yeah. know because as he's maturing, why should he carry that? And right. I didn't know. And you and, already knew that he was negative. Yeah. So and my he, daughter, didn't, he didn't need to know because you'd had uh, checked. Well, and that's, that's the thing is too, is sometimes when kids are younger and they're in it and, and it totally innocent, they could just say, Oh, you know, my mom and my dad are both HIV positive and they accidentally say something to one of their friends, their friends accidentally say something to their parents and their parents mm -hmm. say, well, you, you're not allowed to go to that house anymore. That's right. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And we just didn't want that burden for our kids. So I explained to them why, and they, they understood, um, yeah. Yeah. And it's just part of life now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, uh, let's uh, pivot a bit here and talk about <laughs> your corporate life and how you can apply what you learned there and tell us, of course, what you were doing. But but how can we apply that to our own personal transformation? Yeah. So I spent a lot of time, like I said, building in the in the C-suite as a CEO and and uh, CFO of organizations. Um, I actually owned an airline in Canada oh. and I was oh. CEO of an airline in Canada pre COVID during COVID and post COVID. Um, Which yeah, one? so I, 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 yeah, kind I, of I amazing. <laughs> um, I think in, when we're looking at, again, especially as, as women, if we do have children or we don't have children, but you know, if we have aging parents all of those type of things that we spend um, giving to organizations. And, you know, I was within organizations for probably about eight, 10 years as a CEO and CFO. And I left the corporate world and became a consultant to help um, organizations who are going through mergers and acquisitions. So to create this greater shareholder value. So I would be like a parachute CEO, the board of directors or the owners would terminate kind of their C-suite. I would come in with other individuals. We would help them organize their um, strategic plans to provide the greatest shareholder return. And then I would replace myself and move on to, the, to my next uh, client. I got paid very, very well. Um, mm. But what I, what I noticed at, after a while is you know, these individuals who were giving everything, sacrificing doctor's appointments, sacrificing their relationships, sacrificing yes. their kids' um, sports, they were being terminated because they weren't meeting the corporate objective. Did not, so much they did anything wrong. They may have not had the proper skill set, but at the end of the day, they had a responsibility to provide the greatest value to their shareholders. So again, it goes back to when we work for organizations and we sacrifice that time, it's not mutually beneficial. The corporation mm -hmm. isn't coming back and saying, oh, I'm sorry that you had to, you know, miss your son's hockey game or your daughter's this or your anniversary or your birthday. It's like you need to continue to do what you have to do. So when I look at transformation, it's, it's trying to find the harmony within your life. Like I said, they talk about work life balance. You don't have a work you and a life you. Yeah, we kind of we kind of meld or whatever, but you just have a you and you wear many different hats where you're the wife, you're the mom, you're the daughter, you're the sister, you're the best friend. And you have to try to juggle that time. So when that you is basically that, you're working all the time. That's right. Yeah. And especially now yeah. with technology, your smartphones, all of those things is being in some of the industries I was in too, aviation, forestry there was a corporations now expect their CC suite staff to be on right? all the and time, all the time, reachable. Yeah. yeah. And reachable and you within get... five or 10 minutes. Right. <laughs> if that, <laughs> right. It's like if, exactly. that one minute, if, if that. one minute Immedi yeah. immediately. Yeah. And I think when you look at transformation, it is again, taking that step back and looking at yourself thinking, Am I, am I happy? You know, am I, am I achieving my purpose in life as opposed to just getting up and doing everything over and over and over again? And 
you know, I'm, I'm going to be 54 years old this year. And it's probably only been about the last four or five years where I've really put more focus on the, the whole me as opposed to the corporate external, external stuff. And I, and I think we, we get into these, into these um, again, these hamster wheels about, well, I'll just do this today. And you talk to your kids. I know I've been guilty of it. I've told my kids, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't attend your dance recital. I have to go this or, or, you know, you minimize those really important personal um, roles that should be the highest priority, but our culture just doesn't seem to work that way. So I think when we talk about transformation, it's really just transforming the you, the I am, right? Mm -hmm. That's very good. That's very good. You've talked a little bit about this before, but I was going to ask you if you have anything else about moving to Mexico and how it impacted your personal and professional growth. Were you still doing corporate stuff from there? Yeah, Yeah, I would. So I relocated there about 14 years ago now. um, And I would just fly back and forth to Canada. I mean, I had been in consulting for, for quite a while at this point in time as well. And we're used to working remotely back then, way before COVID, a lot of us. And you had your own airline. Well, I couldn't travel on that, but yeah, it was smaller. no, oh, it was absolutely. smaller. Yeah, yeah. They, didn't, they didn't fly. I would have to make too many stops in order to get. Oh, food. that's okay. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I, I uh, had in my own home office, and I would get up and and I did both my master and doctor degree remotely. So I did my um, master's degree at University of Liverpool and I did my doctorate degree at Cal University. So mm-hmm. I was very used to working and being responsible for the things I had to get done. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would Lots, work at home. That takes my, discipline. Yeah, my kids would be in school and I'd go to work in my home office and I'd fly back to Canada when, when I had to. Um, sometimes it was, you know, once a week. Sometimes it was once every few weeks. Did you have any sort of family network or people that took care of your kids in Mexico when you were in Canada? Sometimes. Yep. Sometimes I'd ask my, I'd call my stepdad and I'd say, Hey, can you come down and watch the kids? Um, And he would come down, (laughs) come down and do that. I mean, over time we ended up getting some really good networks or I ended up getting some really good networks of friends that my kids went to school with. And I would usually only come back for two or three days. So I'd, I'd fly back, have one day meeting or two day meeting and fly back. So it was usually only like a two or three day and, and my kids would stay at their friend's place or something like that. So over time I ended up getting a pretty good network of, of people wow. that would either come stay at our house or my complicated. Kids would- yeah, <laughs> it's very, very complicated to be even to be able to leave town like that. My yeah. gosh. Yeah, yeah, really, really did. And, and how did that emotionally help you as far as transformation and growth? I, I think it. Um, I got to spend key, valuable time with my children. Right. So when we moved to Mexico, like I said, my son was going into grade 12. My daughter was going into grade four. Um, I got to spend that. It wasn't as chaotic as when we lived in Canada. Right. We, we got to have more precious time together. And I think, again, that just transforms you as an individual when now we can look back and we have those memories that we would never have had if I wouldn't have taken a step back while we were in Canada, because, mm-hmm. again, we get into this, um, our, our personal mindset, I guess, in Canada, and I think it's fairly similar to the U.S., is, you know, work first, family somewhere down here. It's second, but it's a far second. And then your community is way down in the bottom, right? Like you, you just kind of live in these little bit of the bubbles. In mm-hmm. Mexico, um, the culture is a little bit different where you put your family first mm-hmm. and then your community and then your work, <laughs> which is a, an actual better way to think about our purpose in life and why we're here. Mm-hmm. I so agree. I got, I got to see firsthand on how families interacted with their kids and how the kids interacted with their families. Very funny, different things. Like I was friends with with my kids' friends on Facebook, and we would all kind of communicate together. In Canada, you would never have that. Like, I would never be friends with my kids as friends because the the culture is different. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. Not not the thing to do on no. Facebook. No, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, but but e- being in a different culture must have been quite a change for everybody. Yeah, and I I think it it um there was a lot of things that we had to embrace. I mean, there was many times, of course, going there, you know, I was unfamiliar with how they did things in Mexico as opposed to how they did things in Canada. So things that we take for granted, you could just run to the local grocery store here. I wasn't able to do that. In fact, probably about five or six years of us living there, I didn't even have a vehicle. So I'd oh. take the bus or I would walk or the kids would take a taxi or we would take the taxi together, and, you know, having to get them registered in school, having to open up a bank account, like all of these things that when you're in your home country, you just learn by what your parents did. But going mm-hmm. there, um, even though there's a lot of expats in Puerto Vallarta, they didn't have kids. They were usually retired. So I had to right. network with a different group of people, um, Mexican families, who was like, okay, show me the ropes. <laughs> right? How do we do this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, getting back to brave thinking, because I, I guess I think we all need it no matter what stage of life we're in. What are what do you think are the key principles of brave thinking and tell us how we can apply them? I, again, I think it goes back to sometimes even if we're standing in a crossroads and you look to the left and you look to the right and you look what, what, what you would absolutely love and it's scary. You need to put on that brave thinking cloak or whatever to say, I'm going to still do it scary. I don't know what the outcome's going to look like, but I am still going to do it even though I'm scared and you just take those one step at a time, one step at a time. I mean, we can still always change our minds, but again, I think it's, it's, we're here to live. I think the best life that we can try to do it as regret free as possible and take those chances. Cause again, we don't know how much time we're going to have. Um, you know, even if it, if it's not, um, you know, uh, loss of a job or an illness or something where, you know, I wish I would have done those things when I had the capacity to do it for whatever Mm -hmm. circumstance. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think that's where we have to be brave and act boldly to just say, Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm going to, I'm going to have faith in myself and trust in myself and take those scary steps. Well, tell us how we can change our mindsets and release scarcity so we can attract prosperity. Yeah. Well, if, if your listeners, uh, if they go to my website, I also have a free downloadable book, which we can talk about at the end as well. But again, when you talk about releasing mindsets and scarcity, it's getting up and being in the now, regardless of the situation that's going on. So, um, with the actual fact, there is certain facts in our lives. Your bank account balance may not be exactly where you want it to be. And, you know, we talk about different things about abundance and stuff, but you, you have to be the I am, right? The walking the walk, doing the do, putting the, putting the cloak on as I am this person. This is my bank account. Regardless of what the factual situations are, this is the, Burke, this is, this is the reality I'm going to be living in. It's not that you're being a fake person. This is who I am while it's all working out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, there's different types of of mindsets and and glad to offer your um, listeners uh, a free download for sure. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, Do you have a roadmap for personal transformation? And also, how can you advise, say, boomers to follow that map? (laughs) <laughs> people who are people who are in another a, a later act in their life. I don't think I don't think there's there's anything that's ever too late. Some of the some of the most significant changes in people's lives happened later in their 60s, 70s and 80s. I think it's recognizing that you want to try something new or you want to embrace a change, that's the key. Right? Is you know Sometimes uh, a loved one, a spouse, a partner may have passed away or you find yourself Mm -hmm. divorced or you're now retired and you're sitting back and you're thinking, well, now what? Yeah. You know, as when I was younger, I wanted to do A, B and C. 
but now I'm a little bit older. The bones are a little bit more stiff. I don't know if I can do all those things, but we all still have life in us. Maybe you want to do um, a cooking class or maybe you want to do painting or, or crocheting or, or write a book, all of these different things, climb mm -hmm. a mountain, but it's just taking the steps and realizing, taking that step back, asking yourself, what would I love? And then what can you do with what you have from where you are to take those little baby steps? Yeah. And Mary and I really get that because we've both lost our spouses mm -hmm. and we've had to regroup. And now we have this podcast and we're moving on, but it's, it's, there's a lot of things, obstacles in the way that we have to think about and deal with. And so True. we've, been, we've been a good support system for each other. Really, we certainly this. have. But even then we, I wake up some mornings and think, what am I going to do today? Where am I going? What is this all about? You know, what's next? Yeah. Well, and I think, I think, you know, you guys have, you've, you've taken some scary steps yourself. You started a podcast, right. And, yeah. and, and like you said, both of your spouses have passed away. So you've had to redefine who you are in the space that you're occupying. And it sometimes it is difficult where we have those sad days or those sad moments to get up and dust ourselves off a little bit and move forward. But I mean, kudos to both of you look at with your podcasts and scary steps. <laughs> Yes, yeah. scary steps. Mm -hmm. uh, Justina, what would you like our audience to have as a takeaway today? Well, your audience can definitely go to my website. It's www.unlockyourpowerwithin, all one word, dot ca. Um, there's a free downloadable uh, PDF on abundance there. And there's also different programs that your listeners may be interested in. They can absolutely reach out to me to see if if some of the programs I have that they may be interested in. Yeah. Mm, thank sounds you so good. much. That sounds great. I'm going to do it. Uh, thank <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Tristina. Thank you, our, guest, our guest today on Late Boomers has been Dr. Tristina Anderson, author of Resilience, Picking Up My Shattered Pieces, former C-suite executive speaker and life mastery consultant. And again, you can reach Tristina and download her book at www unlock your power within and um thank you dot and ca dot ca for Canada. Oh, don't forget I because often, people that's really important people dot, in the states don't uh, realize that you say well and another thing uh mary and kathy if your listeners are interested um my memoir can be found too at uh www.resiliencebook.ca and again there's some free gifts there as well if they if they register so um, well, that sounds good in reading that yeah. Sounds good. We want to um, thank our listeners for subscribing to our podcast and for checking us out on YouTube and recommending us to your friends. We appreciate you and we'd love to have you give us a five-star review. And we want to hear about your experiences with late boomers and what gets you inspired. We are on Instagram at I am Kathy Worthington and at I am Mary Elkins and at late boomers. Thank you for listening. Please join us next week when we talk to integrative wellness coach T.K. Mitchell, who will help all our boomers unlock the secrets to reclaim our health and purpose so we can rock our golden years. Thank you again, Tristina. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Mary. And thank you to your listeners. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us on Late Boomers, the podcast that is your guide to creating a third act with style, power, and impact. Please visit our website and get in touch with us at lateboomers.biz. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes of Late Boomers, go to ewnpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most other major podcast sites. We hope you make use of the wisdom you've gained here and that you enjoy a successful third act with your own style, power, and impact.